to explain back at headquarters. I know what you mean. Well, good morning. Don't you love that? You want to watch it again? <laughs> you know, there's two things. That today we're talking about uniting as a family. And for the next few weeks, last week, and then for the next few weeks, I'll be talking about, I love this place, talking about Surfside, talking about our church, our family. And like I said earlier, listen, we want to be a family, not a business. And now, now let, me, let me back up for a second because I want to tell you, we have good business principles. Um, you know, we use a CPA. We do our taxes right. Our members can actually go and look at our books if you want. We have open books to our members. You can't look and see what people gave. You can't say what did you know, Bob give. But, um, but, but you can look and see what we spent. You know, where did, where did the money go? How did we do it? We, we vote on our budget, all those things. But we do all of that as a family. And as a family, we need to realize those two things that he said that are so true and even scripturally more true. Ohana means family. Family means that no one gets forgotten or left behind. And the other thing we need to realize is that we're broken. But it's still good. Even though we're broken, it's still good. God uses broken people, people who've been through the mill, people who've suffered, people who've struggled. If you don't think he does, then you have to read this book called the Bible. Because some of the people that God used the most would have been the biggest failures in the world's eyes. When you look at the disciple Peter and you see that he failed over and over and over. Peter is the patron saint of all ADD people. He's the one that jumps out of the boat, cuts off somebody's ear, talks back, says, I don't know who he was, you know, blurts. And yet, he's the very one that God used to save thousands and thousands of people right after, right after Christ went back to heaven. Do you realize that um, when it comes to family, you have a choice? And if you do this thing called life right with your family, you will not only do what you've done and be a blessing, but you'll leave a legacy. If you really do this unity thing right, not only will you have family here on earth, but you will leave and disciple and leave a legacy of the things that you know how to do. You will teach others to do what you know how to do. And when you and I are long gone, There'll be others carrying on what God not used in us to then teach others how to do. That's what discipleship means. Literally, the word discipleship is this idea, uh, it, it's this image. You know, Greek words a lot of times have an image. <clears throat> and the word disciple means to be dusty, which is really weird. It means to be, and what it is, it's to be in the dust of the master. See, we've taken church and we've messed it up. We think that church is about rows and church is about circles. Now, we do rows on Sunday because we gather people here. It's like the book of Acts. We gather people here. But we want to get you in teams and we want to get you in small groups. And we want to get you where you're going to meet with other people at other times so they know who you are. Because the only way that you won't be left behind and you won't be forgotten and that people can get to know your brokenness and you talk to people and you see them and you go, oh, you're broken too? is if you get in a relationship where you actually talk to people. So before we go any further, I want you to just take a moment, just look around you. Some of you missed the hello earlier. Just say hi to somebody around you. Welcome them to the family. Just say hi. Good morning to you. Now, you three have to talk to each other. You're kind of over there on an island over there. You heard about the guy who, um, <clears throat> who was on a desert island for years. And they finally found him and they went to pick him up. And they go in there with the boat. And as they're leaving the island, the, the driver of the boat, the captain, looks back and he notices there's three buildings. And he says to the guy, what's that building? The guy says, oh, that's my house. He said, what that, what's that other building? He said, oh, that's my church. The guy said, well, what's that other building? He said, well, that was my first church. I didn't like those people. 
You know, if you're in church for very long, if you really get to know people, there are going to be days. I've told people, you join a small group, and the first few weeks you go to small group and you think, wow, these leaders, they're such great Christians, and look what God's done. And about week four, you're saying, i got to call the pastor. These people should not be leading a group. Because we're all broken and we're all messed up, but yet God calls us. Here's the first thing today. When we talk about family, family requires unity in essentials. If you grew up in a family, you had rules. You had the way you did things. So have you, how many of you had dinner together at least three times a week as children? Okay, listen, that's important. That's important. How many of you want on family vacations together? That's good. Those are the times. And what happened on family vacations was when you learned about what really mattered because the car broke down or the rain came down or something went wrong or some, one of the kids got the stomach flu, which that's always fun, or something happened. Or like me one time, I actually, it was raining really hard and I brought a lantern in a tent. You know you shouldn't do that, right? Unless it's LED. Uh, uh, you know, so you learn these things and you go, don't do that again, right? You find out about family. But the other thing that family does is family passes on what you know to other people. And I'm going to talk more about that next week. But when I was young, I worked for my dad. And working for my dad was one thing because I don't know how many of you had parents that owned businesses. I know I've talked to a few folks in my small group. And usually if your parents own a business, let me tell you something as a child. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. If your parents own a business, for most people, it's a terrible thing. My dad did not want us to ever work construction and and in hindsight, I wish he hadn't told us that. But anyway, but he, he didn't. And, and so he made our lives miserable. And I'll never forget, I went to work at the church. He, he got me a job at the church. And um, I first started out just turning on lights. And then they wanted me to learn how to wax floors like this. And so Bob Beck, Bob Beck was a World War II veteran. He was a Navy man. And he was a tattoo artist on a Navy ship. He probably did more tattoos than any tattoo artist on earth. Because hundreds and hundreds of teenage sailors all wanted tattoos, and that's what he did. He had tattoos head to foot, and yet he didn't like tattoos. That was what was funny. But anyway, he, um, but he talked about, uh, uh, he wanted to show me how to work this buffer machine. So he takes me in this big room. There's this big room. There's nothing in it. He said, I want to teach you how to work this, and we're doing it in this room because this machine can kill you, which is always a good start to a conversation. And he said, I want you to grab a hold of it and see what happens when you squeeze that trigger. And sure enough, I squeezed it. And, and if you don't know anything about a buffer machine, you could be a 500-pound man and it will throw you against the wall and kill you, stomp on your head. It's not good. But he wanted me to learn by myself. So I would listen, I guess. I don't know why he thought I'd have struggle listening. Anyway, so I squeezed the handle and sure enough, that thing runs across the room and runs me into the wall. And he goes, okay, now you're ready to listen. He brings the machine back, and he grabs the machine. He said, it's all about balance. And he grabs it with one hand, and he balances that big buffer machine, shows me how to do it, shows me how to strip the floors, how to wax. I can still do all that stuff. I got to where I could do that with two things. And then he would turn it over to me. Okay, now I want you to try it. And it would run, and he'd say, no, no, you've got to lift up on it. You've got to push down. Now try to push down on it, and it'll go left. Pick up on it, it'll go to the right. And I learned how to use that. I, mean, I got to where two fingers I could... Do that machine look like I was working really hard, you know? And what did he do? He took what he knew and he poured it into my life. Is there anything that you know how to do that you're pouring into the life of someone else? See, in, a, in order to do that, we first have to agree on the essentials. So in church, what are the essentials? That's shown in Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 7. And here's what it says. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But, I love this last sentence, and I'll come back to it in a minute. But, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportions it. Now, people will take this verse out of context, and they'll say, see, there shouldn't be denominations. And actually, this verse says the opposite of that, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, it says here, though, there's one Lord. Basically, if you're part of a Bible-believing church, they will say what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's one of the things in the church we agree on, that Jesus is the only way to God. Now, I'm not the one that said that. The pastor didn't make it up. We also agree as a church that the Bible is going to be our standard, not anything the pastor says or anybody else says. It's going to be the Bible. Not that I always get it right even. But as we read his word. So Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. One faith. Our faith in God. Our faith in Jesus Christ. And then one baptism. That's not talking about the baptism that we do, even though we love baptism here and we love to be baptized as believers I was baptized as a child, and then later when I was 18, and I had surrendered my life to Christ, and I made a conscious decision, I was later baptized as a believer, because I wanted to be baptized the way it talked about in the Bible, as a believer, by dunking, or immersion. I like dunking better, that's more fun. Like a chicken McNugget. All right, so anyway, so then I was dunked like a chicken McNugget. But this is really talking about that spiritual baptism. And so some people say, this means that we only have one church. But listen to what it says at the end. The end of that verse says this. But to each one, a grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. You know what that last sentence is saying? We are all different. We all like different things. We all have different preferences. Some of you wish the music was louder. Some of you wish the music was softer. Some of you wish we sang more hymns. Some of you wish we sang Gregorian chants. I've never had anybody ask for that. But anytime somebody says, I want to sing older music, I'm like, in Monte Oliveti. But, you know, nobody asked for that. But anyway, so, you know, everybody has different styles. But what do we do? As a family, we unite under the things that matter. I'll never forget going to Flamingo Road. Flamingo Road in Miami was a church that was dying. They were in the middle of a growing community, and they were dying. The new pastor came, and he said, listen... We've got to begin to change how we do things. They were doing organ music, wearing suits and ties. And, you know, they had the, the pastor who was up there with the, with the Kleenex on his forehead. You know, oh, and today we're going to talk about uh, what God is going to, you know, the whole deal. And he said, we need to change. So they started doing contemporary music. Actually, when I went to church there, it freaked me out a little bit because they started church with a Rolling Stones song. Uh, yeah, start me up, which was a little bit weird. They didn't sing it, obviously, because the words are bad. But, but, I knew, but I knew when church started, because I heard start me up. I said, oh, I guess they're getting ready to start things up. And so I walked in. But I'll never forget, he had an older lady who was working in the back. I think she was doing the coffee in the back. They had it kind of in the back of the church. And I'll never forget, and I don't remember her name, but we're going to say it's Helen. <laughs> and so I'll never forget, he's talking about the music and how they changed all the music. And he looked in the back and he said, Miss Helen! Yes, Pastor? Miss Helen, do you like the music here at our church? <laughs> she yells from the back, heck no! Just like that. I mean, she didn't say no, she said heck no. And he said, well then why do you stay here? And she said, because I love to be a part of what God is doing. She, she wanted to be a part of a church where God was changing lives. And so she was willing to compromise the things that she didn't weren't essential in order to make a difference in people's lives. Listen, if you are part of a family, part of a family is compromise. If you go to Disney World with me and my children, I have the most horrible experience every time I go. Because every time I go, we're going past Peter Pan. I love Peter Pan. I love people. We're, go, we're going near Philhar Magic. I love Philhar Magic. But then on your left is this horrible, horrible ride. And my children love it. And Lydia, every time, says, It's a small world! <laughs> and I go on It's a Small World, not because I love It's a Small World. And by the way, I don't go on It's a Small World and go, I hate It's a Small World. Because how is that helping the family? We're having some great family time. I'm going to pout the whole time. No, I go on it and I enjoy it. You know what I do? I take pictures of the kids going. While I'm going. And then the boat gets stuck inevitably every single time, you know. But, but as a family, what do I do? I go out of my way. I, I compromise non-essentials. I say I'm willing to give up my preferences to be a blessing to somebody else. That's what we do as a church. You can't have church custom tailored for you. If you do, it would be just like that island. You would have a church for you, and then you'd get fed up with yourself, and you'd build another church. The reason, by the way, the reason that's funny is because we all know that's really true. Grace is all about recognizing that there's differences. 
You are different than everyone around you. And some of you are very, very <laughs> different. And that's okay. We're the only church I know that has about six people with different color hair. It's awesome. In essentials, in essential beliefs, we have unity. And in non-essential beliefs, we have grace with each other. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 14. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling, that's without fighting, about disputable matters. Disputable matters are about things that don't help you make it into heaven or not make it into heaven. Disputable matters are about things where you might agree with somebody and you might not agree with somebody. My grandmother did not think you should dance. I actually got yelled at for dancing one time at my sister, uh, my cousin's wedding. I was a little kid and I danced. I did the John Travolta at her wedding and I really did. It was hilarious. And um, it's a good thing there wasn't YouTube back then because it would still be online. But um, my little white tux, I was in a little white tux. And, and it's about this tall. And uh, my grandmother yelled at me. Because when she was little, she went to a church where there was dancing, and then they brought out snakes. Oh, oh yeah. And so she re- equated dancing. The next thing you know, they'll be bringing out snakes. So she thought dancing was wrong. So for my grandmother, that was a big deal. So what do we do? We, we don't fight over disputable matters. And then later in the chapter, verse 12, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. By the way, there is a verse that says that the church, we should judge each other. But that's not talking about non-essentials. That's talking about essentials. You know, if you come into church and you start whacking your kid, we're going to not only judge you, we're going to whack you back. Okay? So... Okay, maybe not. But, uh, but we're going we're gonna to hear. Okay? Each, but then each of us will give an account. Let's stop passing judgment. Instead, listen to this. Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. My favorite story about this is about some German Baptist women meeting some American Baptist women. This was years ago, before the internet. And... Uh, the, the Baptist women were going over and were going to go to Germany and they were going to meet with these women, Baptist women from Germany. And the American women found out two things. The American women didn't drink wine, but they wore makeup. And they found out that the German women drank wine with dinner and didn't wear makeup. They felt like makeup was a big deal. So the American women showed up in Germany, no makeup on. I want to say that again. No makeup on. Some of you women are like, oh, how would you? You know, two things that I think are very essential in our church. Makeup, deodorant. Okay? Both of those things are important. If you don't believe in either of those things, to me, I'm putting that up there with one baptism. Makeup. I'm just kidding. I, but, so so the, the American women show up not only with no makeup on, but they show up with a thing of wine in their hand for the German women. The German women came walking out, lipstick, makeup, no wine. And they all laughed because they realized that they carried out this passage. They didn't want to fight about things that didn't matter. They wanted to to unify on the essentials that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is the way to God. David Stiers is the one who came up with the thing that you heard. In Lilo and Stitch, he actually plays Jumba, the big, the big scientist. He, if you don't know who that is, he is one of the doctors from MASH, the one that, that the other two always made fun of. That's who that is, and he came up, he's the one who, who they took that quote from. Family means no one gets left behind or forgotten. Now, here's the other thing you need to realize. We don't volunteer with family, we serve each other. I can tell a lot about people... When they say, I volunteer at the church. Now let me ask you a question. If you have children, and your children have to clean their room, or they have to help with the dishes, and they don't want to, do your children look at you and go, I'm sorry, Father. I did not volunteer to wash the dishes today or to clean up my room. Right? If they did that, you would just laugh, right? This is not a volunteer army, son. You've been drafted. (laughs) Congratulations. Welcome to the dishwasher. I'm getting ready to teach one of my children how to wash clothes. Now let me tell you something when you begin to work with people. You realize that not only are they broken, but you're broken. I ruined three of my best shirts last week 
because I left a pen in one of my pockets and now I have three shirts that are coated with beautiful ink. <coughs> I'm an idiot. So what do I do? I, have, I know that I have to teach my child how to wash clothes. I have to teach them, check the pockets, even though your dad doesn't always. You don't just dump bleach on top of everything. That's not what bleach is for, right? You've got to teach them how to do all that stuff. You know, when to use hot water, when to use cold water. Now, I'm not a sorter. Some of you I know are whites and colors. My thing is, if they get from the laundry room into the washing machine, I don't care what color it is. Just wash it in cold water and you're good. But that's, that's not an essential. So we're good. You don't have to argue with that. All right, number two. Discipleship takes place in small groups. Small groups are where we have family. Everyone loves to be missed. Do you know that everybody loves to be missed? I was in charge of scouts for a small group of scouts a few years back. And I think we had about 10 boys in that one group, but there was about 50 total. But the one group that I led had about 10. I got sick for three weeks. In those three weeks, no one called not only to check on me, but to see where I was or what I was doing. Week four came, and here's what I decided to do. I'm not going. I'm going to see if they notice. I'm, you know what? Nobody ever asked me where I was, what happened. I was the leader. It wasn't like I just went to scouts. I was the leader. And guess what? They didn't need me. So guess who did quit helping in scouts? Because I said, well, they don't need me there. Listen, that happens in churches all the time. We've got to get in groups small enough that people miss you, that they care about where you are. One of the best things that happened last night, I came to church and I noticed that we just had a few ladies practicing last night. So I said to one of the ladies, hey, where are the other ladies? She told me where every single one of them were because she had already checked on them. She knew what was going on. She knew what was happening in their family. They knew each other. Listen, if you've been at our church more than a few months and you haven't, gotten in a group with people, whether it's, listen, whether it's a family life group or a small group or whether it's a team, you know, whether you help in the kitchen or you help at the front door or you help in the children's ministry or you want to volunteer on the stage, we're going to have sign up sheets after the service. I would love you to sign up. Maybe you want to be a greeter at the door. One of the best ways to meet people is greet people. Hey, and if you're not going to be on any of those teams, just greet people anyway. That's a great ministry. Not every ministry that you do will be at the church, but we're called not to volunteer. We're called to serve. We are servants. So what we do is we pray about it and say, God, what do you want me to do? And then we do what he calls us to do. We don't volunteer. Volunteer is like we're doing God a favor. You're not doing God a favor. He's not in heaven going, oh, I wish I could get some people to help. He calls us to do what we're called to do. In Matthew 28, it says this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. He's called us to be disciples, to teach someone else what we know how to do. What do you know how to do? What do you know how to do that you can pour in to someone else's life? Even when Jesus was here, did you know he sent the disciples out to minister to people? Even when Jesus was here, he said, you guys go and minister to people. The angels came, remember, to talk about the birth of Jesus? And who did they go to first? Do you remember? They went to the shepherds, right? They went to the shepherds and they told the shepherds, hey, we're going to tell everybody so you shepherds don't need to do anything, right? No, the angels went back to heaven and said, shepherds, you're, you're in charge of letting everybody know that Jesus is here. He leaves us in charge of discipling one another. The reason you're here today is because somebody discipled somebody. Somebody told somebody about Jesus and poured into their life. Somebody taught somebody how to read the Bible. Somebody spent time talking to them about prayer. Somebody spent time talking to somebody about their struggles and their hardships. They discipled one another. That happens in small groups. It happens when you get to know each other. Listen, if you don't have time to be in a small group, if you don't have time to serve in a ministry where people can know you, I would encourage you, find somebody in our church and point at them and say, Hey! Can we meet once a month for breakfast or lunch or dinner or go to the park? Connect with people so that somebody misses you. So that you begin to have a family. So that you leave a legacy that's not just about you, but about pouring your life into other people. Some of you don't have families here in town. Well, 
You're part of a family here, but you've got to get around your family to be part of it. In Acts 2, it talked about the early church. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts. I love when we have fellowships and eat together. I get to know more of you that way than almost any other way. They had, they ate, and then praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If I had to choose whether you should be in a small group or in church, I would say get in a small group. But here's one thing I've learned, because I've got some friends who go, well, I don't believe in traditional church anymore, I just do small group. Here's what I've realized. When we do church like this, and you're encouraged, and you're inspired in a large group, more people then get in small groups. More people because we talk about it. We're able to get people who would never show up at a small group to come and be inspired and encouraged. And we get encouraged together. We learn about God's word. And then we're plugged into a small group to then we become family. We get to know each other. We care about each other. We notice when they're missing. And here's the big four about our church. I'm not going to go over these today. But last week we talked about scripture and prayer. We hold the Bible up as our standard. We unite as family in small groups. We replicate through apprenticing. I'll talk about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about spiritual gifts next week. And then four environments for growth. I love that. Finally, families serve together. Have you ever been around a spoiled child? See, there's two main reasons that people don't serve in churches. Number one, they went to church, and when they first went to church... They weren't told they needed to serve. And sometimes, the second reason is sometimes there's people who say, no, no, I got this. This is my ministry. I have the ministry of the chair. I move this chair. I take this chair. I put it in the lobby. And then every week I bring it up here. That's my job. Well, can I help with the chair? No, nope, my chair. And what happens is the other people learn how to be selfish. It's like a parent. I had, I had a kid down the street. His name was Todd. Oh, gosh, I hope he doesn't watch this. Okay, but... but <laughs> He was one of my neighbors, and Todd was the most spoiled child I knew. His mom did everything for him. Everything. He had to wash his feet before he came. He had to take his shoes off and wash his feet before he came in the house. That was the only thing I knew he had to do. He didn't clean his room. He didn't vacuum. He didn't mop. He didn't do dishes. He didn't have to straighten up anything. And it made him more and more selfish. If we go to church and we think, oh, we'll hire people to do those things, then what happens is we begin to become selfish and self-centered and we begin to come to church and we think, oh, well, our job is to come for the show on Sunday morning or Saturday night and we sit for the show and then we go home and then we wonder why people are dropping out of church. The other thing that happens is people grab a hold of something and they don't let go of it. A few weeks ago, we visited a church looking at a missionary, and somebody from our group grew up in that church. And there were about 16 people. This church used to have hundreds and hundreds of people. We had about 16 people in our small group. We had more people than the church had, and I'll talk more about that next week. And so what I said to one of our ladies when we were leaving, I said to her, I said, uh, so are those the same people that were there before? She said, yes, but there's less of them. I said, what do you mean there's less of them? Yeah, a bunch of them have died. So what happened? Well, they had always done what they did, wouldn't let anybody else do it. So over the years, they're still at the same door they were always at, passing out the same bulletin they always passed out, and nobody else is allowed to be a part. So over time, what happens? They're the only one that does it. And over time, people that come and want to be involved and want to become unselfish go, well, I don't really get anything out of church. And they so enjoyed passing out the bulletins that they chose to keep it to themselves. Listen. When you really enjoy what God's given you to do, realize that God wants other people to do that too. So go out of your way to encourage other people. That's one of the reasons we have sign-up sheets in the lobby today. 1 Peter 4 says this, Each of you should use whatever gift you've received, whether it's from God or from someone else, whatever gift you've been given, to serve others. You take it and you pour it out. Faithfully stewards God's grace, faithful stewards of God's grace, In its various form. Anybody see the word volunteer in there at all? It's not in the Bible. We're servants. God gave you something and he says, now use it to be a blessing to somebody else. If anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. How's that for a high standard? If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides. So that in all things, the person who's serving can get praised. 
No. In all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. See, we tend to be on one side or the other. We tend to think, well, I'm not doing anything. I don't want to serve. Or we tend to serve and think it's about our gift. Instead of saying, God, what do you want me to do with this gift? Who can I teach to do what I already do maybe better than I did it? One of the saddest stories I ever heard was a guy I talked about this years ago. And he's still a friend of mine. His dad owned a mechanic shop. And this guy did not know how to change his own oil. I said, how in the world can you not? I said, I know how to change oil. My dad was a contractor. And he taught me how to change the oil in my car. He said, well, my dad didn't want me to learn how to be a mechanic. So he didn't teach me anything. So his dad took all of his knowledge and all of his wisdom to the grave with him. And his son doesn't even check the oil in his car. Listen. Whatever gift God has given you, pour it into somebody else. It might not just be something for church. Maybe you know how to play an instrument. Ask God, God, show me somebody that I can teach how to do that. Maybe you know how to crochet. I don't even know if I'm doing that right. But maybe you know how to do that. Teach somebody what you know. Maybe you know how to study the Bible. Take some time. If you're in a small group, take some time to show other people in your small group how you do that. Go out of your way to pour the gift you have into someone else. Galatians 5 says this, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Basically, don't just... Listen, you have freedom. You don't have to do anything. Did you know that? When you become a Christian, you surrender your life to God, you can do whatever you want. God has given you freedom. But this says, but don't use that to be selfish and self-centered. Don't use that to make the church into a business where you're going to hire people to take care of the children. Because you're, By the way, I know a church that literally hired people to take care of the children because all the members said, we're tired of taking care of kids. Let's hire people to do that. You don't do that in your family. That's not a family. That's a business. I'm just saying. Do they preach there? All right. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this command. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've got one final story, but I want to show you a picture. This is Matt Rothacre and his sweet wife. Do you remember Matt? Do you guys remember Matt Rothacre? Did you ever meet Matt from Park Avenue? Anyway, the reason I talk about Matt is I first met Matt, I was teaching school. And I was busy. Not only was I teaching school when I first met him, I was teaching school and working at Quincy's at night. But on Wednesday night, I had a small group with about four guys, and Matt was one of those four. And so I began a meeting with them. We'd play basketball. We would study the Bible. We would study like four verses. (laughs) Then we'd talk about what it meant, and I'd ask them about their week, and I would check on them. If one of them was sick, I knew about it. If one of them ended up in the hospital, I was there to visit them. Why? Because they became my little family. Little Kyle was running around. I remember one of the kids in small group, Kyle, was being potty trained. And when he'd go get potty trained, he'd get him an M&M when he came out. And so the guys in our group started doing that. They'd go to the bathroom and come out and go, do I get an (laughs) M&M? And went out of our way, went out of our... (laughs) Neil got excited about that one. They went out of our way. That's that's how you you need M&Ms? Okay. But we went out of our way to make them a part of the family. A few years later, I went down to Central Baptist in Melbourne. I worked there for three years as a youth and college pastor. Came back. By this time, Matt was college age. And I said, Matt, would you work for me for the summer working with youth? And I began to work with Matt and talk to him and let him lead Bible studies. He went on mission trips with us. I've got pictures on mission trips and began to do things together. Matt has now been a pastor for over five years of a church in Arkansas. Just a few months ago, a tornado came through and destroyed their church building. They're meeting in about four different places. They're probably in a firehouse this morning. And I look back and I realize, you know, that would have never started if I had said, you know, I'm a school teacher. I'm tired of dealing with kids when I get home. So I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to rest. I, you know, I'm working two jobs and i got a little baby at home and I just don't have time to do anything. No, I said, you know what, God, what do you want me to do? And when he said, I want you to work with young men, I began to work with four young men and just to pour out the little bit that I had left. Not much. <laughs> the little bit that I had left. And you never know what God's going to do. <laughs> Not only do we need to do that with our children and give our children chores and make them responsible at home, but we need to pour out into other people's lives and allow them to serve beside us. And we need to get ourselves to serve with other people. This family up here is called the praise team. They know where they are. 
They check on each other. When one of them's sick, they visit each other in the hospital. They bring each other meals. I encourage you. Get in some type of small group, whether it's a Bible study small group or some, where you can connect with other people and you can become a family and you can leave a legacy and you will never be forgotten. You will always...